Hey writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. We're your hosts. I'm Laura, author engagement manager. And I'm Rachel, promotion specialist for Kobo Writing Life. On today's episode, Laura and I chatted with romance author Becca Mack. Becca is an avid and passionate romance reader, writer, and a kindergarten teacher. Becca enjoys writing swoon-worthy romance with lovable and relatable characters, loads of humor, and a healthy dose of drama on the way to a happily ever after. We had so much fun chatting with Becca. We talked to her all about her publishing journey from writing on Wattpad to becoming an indie author to now working with a traditional publisher with Simon & Schuster, as well as her path to becoming a writer. We also enjoy talking to her about writing hockey romance as a Canadian and how having an accurate portrayal of hockey in her books is important to her. And I personally loved chatting with Becca about how much better the Toronto Maple Leafs are than the Montreal Canadiens, which Laura did not love as much as I did. Definitely did not love that conversation. But overall, we had so much fun chatting with Becca and we think you'll really enjoy our conversation. We are joined today by romance author, Becca Mack. Becca, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Can you kind of just kick things off and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Oh my God. (laughs) I should have warned you guys that I hate talking about myself. Um, But I am a romance author. I'm also a kindergarten teacher, which always shocks people because their first question when I tell them I wrote books is, do you write children's books? Yeah, I am from Ontario in Canada, and I, I don't know, I always call myself a little bit of a sarcasm queen, and I'm a professional procrastinator to my core, so I do my best writing uh, a couple weeks before my manuscript is due, (laughs) and yeah, I have two kids and a bunch of animals, and that's me in a nutshell. The procrastination piece is wildly relatable. Really spoke to us (laughs) with that one. I um, only work well under crushing pressure. So we feel, we feel that. <laughs> um, you've spoken a lot before about how you started writing as kind of an escape during a particularly hard time in your life. Can you speak a little mm-hmm. bit to this? And had you always wanted to be a writer before that? Yeah. So when I was little, I like I've always been a reader. I always have loved. I, I mean, I, I think I've always kind of stuck to um, either women's fiction or romance even when I was younger like the little ones also did a lot of my mom had one of those giant bookcases with all the historical romances on it you know with that guy that shirtless guy on the cover and I was that kid who was like reading it every time my parents were out um, and then shoving it back on the shelf frantically I always loved romance so but yeah in the school I used to really love writing I always bragged that like I got some writing awards and English awards when I was um, in school, but nobody apparently cares about the <laughs> awards you get when you're 14 years old. But yeah, I I kind of fell off the wagon and stopped reading for a while there. Um, and then my brother passed away in 2018. And I, I just, you know, my mental health really took a nosedive for a while there. And I started going to therapy and, you know, partway through my journey, my, my therapist was like, like, I think you need a creative outlet that helps so many people with grief. And I was like, well, you know, I've always wanted to write a book, but like, obviously there's no future there. I'm not ever going to actually be an author because it just seems like one of those, you know, jobs and things that like don't happen to regular normal people. And she was, and also I think I was, so this was in the end of 2019 so I was 29 and I'm like well I'm 29 so I can't very well start like trying to achieve this brand new dream now and she was kind of like well why not so I literally just pulled out my laptop one day and started writing and I became super obsessed with it (laughs) Um, I was writing like crazy wild amounts I think So I started in January 2019 or 2020. So I started right at the beginning of the year. And then I, because I was a a kindergarten teacher, COVID closed the schools and, you know, I didn't have anything to do. I was writing like upwards of 10,000 words a day 
because I just had nothing else to do. We didn't have any kids or anything at the time. Um, And I was super inspired. And I really did find that it helped me so much um, with my grief and my mental health in general. It was just such an amazing creative outlet. And on top of that, it felt like I finally kind of found, you know, that thing that I was really good at, really enjoyed. And I started sharing it in the summer of that year on like a little app called Wattpad um, because I was like, I actually feel like, you know, that this might be good. People might like this. And I wanted to kind of get, you know, some feedback on it. And I discovered that website and people loved it. And I was like, oh my God, this is such an amazing feeling, which is like, it just really helped me so much. And then for me, uh, you know, my books are primarily, I would say romantic comedy, but they have a lot of um, mental health in them. So a a lot of mental health and they almost all touch on grief. Some are just, you know, a little bit and some are really quite in depth and really emotional parts, but it's helped me so much writing through my grief. And it's, it's not only helped my grief, but it's helped kind of bring other things to the surface that I've been able to work through. And it's just an amazing outlet. And another thing that's really great with it is having people reach out and say like they they feel so seen and that it's helped them work through things as well. So it's been really fantastic in that sense. I was going to ask if you found the writing was more of an escape or if it was a tool that you were able to use, but it sounds like it was a little bit of both. It is a hundred percent and it's really can be really cathartic. (laughs) It's funny because like I'll reread a part and I'll just be sobbing sometimes because I'm like, oh my God, I didn't realize that like, you know, I put so much of myself into this. Like, you know, you're doing it at the time, but then when you go back and you reread it and like, you realize like how much of, you know, yourself and your like soul or, you know, how much of your own life you've put into these characters and these stories. And it is, it's really, it can be really difficult to read sometimes. It could be really eye opening, but it's always cathartic at the end of it. So it's definitely been a a tool for me. Your bio says you're a super fan of dragging you through hell on the way to a happily ever after. Is that kind of just speaking to that emotional part of your work? I'm going to say yes, but like not necessarily like those hardest, like, you know, those deepest bits, but just like, I really love angst as well. So like, in the romance genre specifically, you have a lot of people that hate things like miscommunication. And I actually really love them because I am a, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on here. So I'm just gonna say I'm a really bad (laughs) communicator. And so those things feel really real to me. And so I, I like to see real and relatable in stories. So I really like them. But like, I love third act breakups. And something really hot right now in romance is no third act breakups. And I think like there's a time and a place, like there are couples where it just does not suit to have them break up. But I also love them because I love the groveling. I love the emotion that it can bring. But yeah, I, I really like to put my readers through it in terms of the angst and that kind of stuff, but also everything else that like the really sad bits uh, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. You mentioned you've had reader feedback saying that they really relate to the characters and that the books have helped you have you or helped them. Have you ever had feedback just yelling at you for the angst that you've put them through? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, I mean, I, I just mentioned the miscommunication thing. And I mean, I know that there's a difference between like a miscommunication trope where the whole book is like based off of you know, conflict surrounding miscommunication. And then there's just like, you know, a miscommunication that happens here and there. But oh my gosh, like I, in one of my books, one of the conflicts kind of surrounds miscommunication. And I have had some really upset people that they're just like, oh my God, why would it be so stubborn or what, you know, um, why this, why that? Or yeah, like, you know, trigger warnings and content warnings have become really important in books these days. And I'm going to be honest, before I was writing, I was not like a part of like the bookstagram community or anything like that. I just read on my own. So I didn't really know about things like content warnings before that. And so I remember, you know, one of the books that I released 
like earlier on, it didn't have a content warning and there was something that probably should have had a content warning. And so I've had people come back and be like, I really wish that I had known that this was going to happen because it like totally wrecked me and I need like, you know, two weeks off to just like recuperate. So yeah, I do have, and and it's fun because sometimes it is all in good fun and they're just like, how dare you do this to us? But it can be, it can be, yeah, a lot. People are very passionate about their books and their characters and they do not like when authors mess their lives up. Are you one of those people who looks at reviews or do you kind of stay away from it? No. Okay. Yeah, no, not for me. I am like a highly sensitive twin to my core. Well, your book is like your baby. I think it's okay to be a little sensitive about it. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. And like, you know what? I, I'm like a big believer that we are our own worst critics so you know I I you know put everything I can into these books and then I am constantly like editing them and changing parts and and trying to update them like uh, consider me which is book one in this series you know I wrote that in early 2019 and then I released it on Wattpad later that year and then when I self-published it, I rewrote the entire thing before I self-published it because I was like, I'm a better writer now. I can do this better. I can do that better. I knew some things that, you know, some readers really hated. So I wanted to make some little adjustments. And then when I signed the series over um, with Simon & Schuster recently, I had that opportunity to, to edit it again. And, you know, it's just like constantly, like you're aware that you're growing as an author And you're constantly wanting to put out your best work, but you know, like as soon as I put something out, I am one of those people that's like, oh, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. Reviews give me a huge amount of anxiety. I have stumbled upon bad ones all the time uh, or a couple of times. You know, you're looking to see something on Amazon really quick and you're like, oh shit. Like, (laughs) and I will, it will, it will just, knock me right down for a couple of days. Um, And I think the thing is that there is a difference between a constructive review and constructive feedback and just a negative review. And I think that's the thing is, is that um, the majority of, you know, one star, two star reviews, especially on Goodreads, they're just telling you like, this book was trash or something like this, or I don't know why people liked it or that, you know, there's nothing in there that's going to help you, you know, write a better book next time. It just makes you feel crappy about yourself. And every time I read it, read a bad review by accident, I 100% go, okay, I'm not going to write anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. Because that's just me. I'm super sensitive. I take everything really personally. And I and you know, there's that argument that authors need to build you know, thicker skins. And I'm like, well, I'm still a human being. Um, And if you are somebody who pours your heart and soul into a book, because there are are books and there are authors that just what they write is really light, you know, to their core, and it's not really meant to be deep. And then there are authors who are putting big, massive pieces of themselves into their books and their characters who are super flawed. They're, you know, the author's flaws. So, it is, it, it does feel kind of personal. So yeah, I avoid them. And I, I am like a firm believer as well that my social media should be my safe place. So, you know, I, I think that like, typically, if I'm tagged in a post, I expect it to be um, relatively positive words about my book. Um, and unfortunately you do run across people that tag authors in not the greatest reviews anyways but yeah I am not a review person I will say as somebody who wrote on Wattpad first the thing about Wattpad is that um, people can comment on every single line of the story and if your book is doing really well that means you're getting thousands and thousands of comments on any chapter and you know you're you're getting faced with a lot of a lot of uplifting comments from people who love it and a lot of people who are behind a screen telling you how much this sucks. <laughs> but you can sort through them and and that's, you know, kind of what I was saying earlier is that I from feedback on Wattpad, because I it was kind of forced on me, I was able to adjust things when I self-published 
um, consider me and kind of take in those things into consideration. But now that I don't write on Wattpad, you know, I have alpha readers who are reading as I write and are pointing things out, but they're mostly people that I, I trust. But, you know, they're pointing things out as you go and giving you feedback. And I think that that's the feedback that matters. There's nothing I can do about the book after it's written, you know? So and sometimes a book is just not for somebody. So, yeah, I was going to say there's a very big difference between like non helpful reviews and like don't tag authors if you're going to say something negative. Like that's just, yeah. That's just rude. But then there's also something to be said about like constructive criticism from yes. people you trust. Yes. And I 100%. think you had like such a unique opportunity from going from like publishing chapter by chapter on Wattpad. And then, like you said, taking it back and reworking some things and then like publishing it yourself and then having the opportunity to revisit that content again. Um, I'm just curious what that whole process has been like for you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You know, for, like from the very beginning to here? Just, yeah, like your publishing yeah. journey, if you will. Oh, it, yeah, it's been really wild. I'm going to be honest with you. I First of all, I think that social media has allowed people to kind of pursue dreams that maybe wouldn't have been as as achievable years ago. Um, because social media, I think, has played a huge factor in, in being able to get my books out there. Um, but yeah, it's been really a wild ride because I, I started when I started writing and then, you know, COVID happened very quickly and I was just kind of able to bury myself in writing. It was all for me at like every single word was for me and to make me feel better and, you know, to give me something to do and get my brain working. And then, you know, going from Wattpad and getting that feedback and finding out people liked it was really exciting. And it pushes you to keep writing. It's really motivational. And then I got my first dose of, you know, reality and that like, not everybody is going to like your work. And so it, it was really like kind of a, you know, a all up and down. But yeah, so I think Wattpad served me really, really well. Um, I'm going to be honest, I hate the app. <laughs> with a passion because um yeah it's just it, it's I I really hate to say this but it's kind of like a lot of people feel very comfortable behind a screen um and feel very comfortable just you know tearing people down and I I found that at first where it was you know this really like high point for me and that you know, I was getting to share my work and I was finding out that there were so many people that loved it. And then, you know, came the down where I also, you know, it, it became a negative place for my mental health because it was, you know, people constantly wanting updates and wanting this and wanting that and um, not liking this, not liking that. And you're getting immediate feedback like you, it was it's really really cool because if somebody follows a story as soon as a, an author posts a chapter those people get a notification and then it's like this adrenaline rush as an author because everybody is rushing to read it at the same time and they're commenting and you're like oh my god they love this they love this and then you're riding this high and then one negative comment comes in and it just this an, an immediate crash so for me it was really nice to get off of Wattpad in the end, but it served me really well because I grew quite a following there. I was only on the app for about a year sharing stories, but um, I think I, I think by the time I had finished my last story, I was at about 17,000 followers um, there. And Consider Me had 7 million reads on Wattpad. And so I had when I went to self publish it, I had a following already on Instagram. I had people who, you know, read it on Wattpad and adored it and wanted it, you know, on their bookshelves and stuff. And that helped me so much because first of all, I really didn't know what I was doing self publishing. <laughs> and I was, you know, like, is this a leap that I, I want to take, you know, I, I drained my husband's and I savings account paying for an editor and paying for a cover designer and stuff. And, you know, it, you're kind of stuck in that. Like a lot of self-published authors will publish 
their work and just, you know, self edit or have a friend read it and, you know, do a low maintenance kind of cover. And I completely understand that. But I also think that, that, you know, if you're going to go all in, spend the money and do it because yeah, I just, I, I, that's a personal opinion, but I do think those things are important, but yeah, it was really nerve wracking. And I just remember going like, oh my God, if this fails, like, I've, yeah, I've drained our savings account. Uh, it wasn't a large savings account, but, um, you know, and then it, it did like way better than I could have ever expected. And I kept, you know, I kept thinking, okay, this is it. Like now everybody who's read my book or who's going to read my book has already read it and it's just going to go down from here. And then, you know, it just kept going up and yeah, I just, I honestly could have never imagined being this successful by self-publishing. Um, I think it's so great that self-publishing exists because it just feels impossible to break into traditional publishing. Like, how do you do it? You go, you know, when I, I remember reaching out to a couple of literary agents um, and being like, oh, you know, this book is on Wattpad and it's doing this well and it has this many reads and all this stuff and, you know, not getting a single response. And it just, it just drains you because you're like, well, you think you're doing well and then it feels like you're not because you're not getting responses here. But um, this, I think people really love indie authors right now. Um, I think indie authors are kind of taken over especially in the romance space, it is really, um, really heavy on indie authors. And I think it's super great. And then, um, you know, I started having these traditional pub deals kind of offers rolling in. And it's really funny because when you start writing, that's your only dream is signing with a traditional publisher. But then if you are self-publishing successfully, you're like, is that my dream? Like, I, I don't know, because you do have a lot more control self publishing, you know, you get all this control over your cover, you're not changing things, maybe that you don't want to change in your book, and etc. And you can make it as long as you want, or as short as you want, or, or whatever, you know, and I think there's, I don't know the right word off the top of my head, there's a kind of like standard in traditional publishing, especially with romance right now, there's some filthy language floating around out there. And I always don't know, like, are traditional publishers okay with that filthy of language? Or are they going to make you tone it down a little bit, you know, but it's really, you know, popular in the romance world right now. So it, you know, anyways, there's a different amount of I think control when you're going from self publishing to traditional publishing and you know you realize that you can be successful self publishing and at the same time all this control that you're now like well do I want to give it up there are things that it's just so hard to do on your own you know I was formatting my books on my own and you know so it's just it's time consuming and you're doing everything on your own and you're chasing you know maybe cover design artists and this and that and paying for editors on your own and it's a lot and then with publishing on Amazon which is you know a great platform and I'm so thankful for it especially Kindle Unlimited because I think Kindle Unlimited is just incredible both for readers and for authors there are so many hiccups along the way so many things that happen and if you are doing it all on your own. It's extremely overwhelming or it has the potential to be. And especially if you are somebody like me who is extremely anxious and a worst case scenario expert, because I've had things happen where like, they'll just randomly be like, Oh, you know, we did a check on your book and we're not sure if you have the, um, copyright to the image on your book. So we've removed this book for sale until you can prove it. And then they make you really jump through hoops to like, prove that you have the rights to these things or just like, you know, so like I once had my book removed because um, somebody reported a handful of errors after they read it on Kindle. And I mean, I think I did edit my books, but I think even in published books, you're always finding a typo here and there. And some of them <laughs> were not actually errors. They were, uh, you know, like, I, I think you should reword it to read this way or, you know, so on and so on. And 
I had Amazon actually pull down and it was consider me. So it's, it's book one in the series. It does the best in the series and they pulled it down. And I was beside myself because I'm like, well, this is my income. This is, you know, my career. This is how I'm supporting my family. I, you know, and I, I, as I said, I'm a worst case scenario expert. So I'm going, well, if they can't read book number one, then they can't read book number two and they can't read book number three. And now all my money's gone and I don't have a career anymore. And like, you know, I'm, I'm just that type of person, but there are these like things that really draw you to traditional publishing. And then there are, you know, those thoughts that you're like, well, you know, maybe I'm better doing it on my own and I can be successful on my own. And it's really, I don't know, it's really quite a, a journey and they are, they are actually quite different, but I can say it's incredibly nice to have a team behind me now with Simon and Schuster, just like having those people in my corner and having extra sets of eyes on things and working with people. But it is definitely something to get used to if you've done it on your own first. Now, I have a very important question, <laughs> which is that you write hockey romance. Yeah. And so the question is, are you a hockey fan? And if so, who is your team? Because Laura and I are both hockey fans, but we have different teams. So you're either going to, I have a feeling you're going to be on my side of this rivalry, but we're going to find out. Oh God. Oh God. I'm going to say one of you is a Montreal Canadiens fan and one of you is a Leafs fan. That is correct. And the Montreal Canadiens fan is always wrong. <laughs> it's fine, Becca. I guess I'll forgive you this time. <laughs> The yeah, I'm not even... Canadian span is always wrong is the sound bite I will be pulling from this podcast. <laughs> I'm not even like necessarily a, a Leafs fan. Okay. I am a hockey fan. I grew up on hockey. My brothers played competitively. Um, my husband played competitively. Competitively. My husband still plays hockey. I played hockey uh, growing up. My son, who's only two, is learning right now. He loves it. Like, we are a huge hockey family, and which is one of the reasons I love writing hockey romance, because I really, like, know it, you know? I feel so comfortable writing it. But at the same time, I'm sorry, the Leafs are not great. They continue no, to this point year after year. <laughs> but, like, I don't, yeah, I don't say, like, it's funny. I don't have a team. I have, like, players you know, I like, I have like players that I just adore. So, but it's not the Canadians, but not the Canadians. No, I, but I would say, I guess that the Leafs by fault, because my husband is a Leafs diehard fan watching hockey with him is very entertaining. He feels extreme emotions. <laughs> and no one knows disappointment quite like, like the Leafs Leaf fandom. Yeah. hundred percent. Nobody knows. Yeah. Yeah. To our listeners who don't know, the Toronto Maple Leafs have not won a Stanley Cup since 1967, and we continue yeah. to not win. But along the lines of hockey, like, obviously, you're a fan, you know, the sport through and through. How do you balance kind of explaining the hockey of it all in your books to with like fans or to readers who aren't huge hockey fans? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know what, I don't, and I, depending on the book, some are more hockey focused, and some are less. Oh my goodness. I don't know. You know, I just, I like, I think I tend to write more of the scenes where, you know, like I'm just telling you, like they pass to this person and this person. And if a whistle is blown and somebody is getting a penalty or whatnot, I'm having somebody say like what's happening or something like that. You know, like so one of the girls who's watching the game will argue and be like that, that didn't happen or something like that. I have a lot of ref shaming from the girls in the park. <laughs> but yeah I don't know I, I I do know that people appreciate the accuracy in my books surrounding hockey I get a lot of a lot of um, messages saying that they appreciate that there is actually hockey in the book because a lot of books are marketed as a hockey romance and you know it's just a hockey player and there's never any hockey and that they are accurate, which is really important to me. And I have to say, I have read books and I'm so excited for it. And then like, they're calling the hockey arena, the stadium and the hockey player is carrying their stuff out in a little duffel bag. And I'm going, where are you fitting that equipment? Like, where are those things going? And like, I'll have to stop halfway through because I can't do it. Like, you know, but that's because I know it and I'm passionate about it and I like it. And I know also that hockey is super kind of lucrative right now. It's 
it's in the hot seat. Everyone loves it. But yeah, spo- like people will be like, can you rate football? And I'm like, no, because I don't watch football. I don't like it. I mean, I may be changing my mind because I am now all over the Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift stuff, but <laughs> the game will be on and I'll be like to my husband, are we going to watch the Taylor Swift game? <laughs> But like, I have to write about sports that I know. And for me, that's basically hockey and baseball. I can't do it otherwise, or I'm going to have to do a wild amount of research to make sure it's accurate because it is so important to me. And I know that, you know, there's probably 90% of these readers don't care and are not going to know if, if something is not right. But the people that do know will be sure to point it out to you. (laughs) And I also feel like I have to like uphold, you know, that like that the trust Canadian that those, in you. <laughs> yes, the Canadian in me and the trust that these women who love this sport have placed in me that they know that they can read these books by me and that they're going to be accurate in, in the hockey um, aspect of it. I'm so mad too because I, like if there is something I don't know and it's normally like something about, you know, trades or this trade deadlines and you know that that stuff that like I don't really care about I asked my husband because he knows everything and I'm working kind of in the background on um, a hockey book outside of this series and it's a like one night stand accidental pregnancy and I had this whole thing planned and I needed him to be traded at a very specific time in the story for the final conflict and my husband was like no, you can't do that. And I was like, well, but the rules say that he can be traded after the deadline as long, but he can't play in the playoffs and he can't do this. And my husband was like, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't matter if it's a rule. It never happens. And I was like, you just ruined this whole book for me. And I had to like rewrite the whole timeline. I was so, I was distraught because, and I was like 99% of readers are never going to know, not going to question it, but there will be one person who does. And I'll feel like I failed them we appreciate the authenticity (laughs) because we would be the readers who would notice yeah for sure uh and it's funny too not so much on the hockey aspect but you said like about the canadian like authenticity there i read a somebody on instagram just the other day who was canadian and she was like not necessarily shaming but just saying like i'm so tired of authors writing Canadians and they're so clearly not Canadian themselves and they're just so like stereotypical and everybody's saying bud and a and I'm like I say bud and a 15 million times a day I am like Canadian to my core like I like I tell my friends a story that I have like this neighbor and he's like pretty good looking and the one day I was getting my son out of the back seat of the car and he was walking towards me and like he's good looking enough that like you kind of like oh my god oh my god when he's coming near you and he like looked at me and said hey how's it going and I was like oh hey bud and then I was like oh my god that was so freaking Canadian of me but like that is literally how I speak and this girl's out here going like I'm so sick and tired of people and you're obviously not Canadian I'm like oh man I write all my Canadian characters like that because that is me it's relatable highly relatable it's relatable yeah (laughs) so let's talk about playing for keeps so Mm -hmm. like we said I'm a big hockey romance fan so I really enjoyed reading consider me um which is Carter and Olivia's story where did the idea for this series come from? Was it just kind of like your love for hockey? So I, um, if we backtrack just like a minute when like my brother passed away. And before that, I had just kind of gotten off the whole reading thing. And then I had picked up reading again. And it was literally like the beginning of December 2019. Um, because I was, you know, I need to do something for my brain. It feels like it's just wasting away kind of thing. And I used to really love reading. So I didn't know that hockey romances even existed. This is like how far out of like reading and the romance game I was. I didn't know sports romances existed. I didn't even know that romance books could be funny. And then I picked up Helena Hunting's Pucked series. And I picked up the third book in the series. It went out of order, which I never do now, but it made me laugh out loud, like so much. And I loved it. And she's Canadian. And so the the female main character lived in Guelph. And I was like, oh my God, Guelph, I've been there. And like, it was just, it was so nice. And it was 
like relatable while also like you know you're like everybody i mean let's not let everybody dreams of like dating a rich successful athlete who's extremely good looking and all apparently all of these athletes can just you know last forever so (laughs) it just was like i was like i love this and it's hockey i love hockey i know hockey and I actually have read pretty much only Helena Hunting's hockey series. I'm not a, actually a big hockey romance reader. And maybe that's because accuracy is important to me. And I do find it's hard to find that now. So I've only read a couple. But um, hers, I, I devoured her puck series and her all-in series. And she just inspired me so much because, you know, I was like, wow, I can write about rich athletes. And also hockey and I can be funny (laughs) it's like I want to be funny I want to make people laugh and um I just I what I really loved about her story the one I read um I think it was pucked pucked up was what it was called it was the third one in the series but the uh, main character Randy he is just like a playboy to his core and he's like I don't want to settle down and I loved that like reformed playboy trope and I'm going to be honest with you it's the first time I read it which again is embarrassing because that was only a couple of years ago but like that's how far out of the game I was and I wanted to write this like super cocky arrogant guy who never ever is told no in his life and I wanted to just tear him down and have him like immediately obsessed and I wanted the girl to be like no it's not happening and then I don't know like everybody's always asked me you know like where the inspiration for Carter came from and I always go I have no no clue like he's entirely a figment of my imagination because he is I think he's quite unique because there are a lot of cocky arrogant playboys out there But Carter is not just a cocky, arrogant playboy. He is like a golden retriever to his core. And he is super goofy. He's downright immature. I'm not going to lie to you. But he's very mature emotionally (laughs) once he's in a relationship. But he is like super goofy. And I just adored writing him so much. And it's funny because I look back at him now. And he's like always like singing and just he's really out there and I'm actually not out there like I am quite reserved I don't like attention and he loves attention but you know I'll like my daughter will wake up my husband sent me a video my daughter had woken up from a nap and he saw it on the camera in her room I like sprang into her room and like arms wide and I was just singing and I was dancing and like getting her out of her bed and he sends me this video because I just apparently get my daughter up from naps with flair and Carter does everything with flair and I was like oh my god I'm Carter Beckett like that's where my inspiration (laughs) for Carter Beckett came from is me like (laughs) I think he would be me if I had all the confidence in the world and was not shy. Like everything I do kind of like in the comfort of my own home, he's just doing it all the time. But it actually was not originally meant to be a series. I thought it was, and and, you know, maybe this is because, you know, as a brand new writer and I was just like, it's going to be a miracle if I can even write a book. Um, But he was, it was meant to be a, a one shot, which is why two of the main characters are already together Um, when the book starts but then as I you know wrote through it I was like okay well there's so much potential for Adam here because he needs a happy ending because you know as a secondary character and in the book his his girlfriend uh, long girlfriend cheats on him and he's just like the sweetest guy alive so I'm like well he needs a happy ending and then I was like oh and there's so much potential between Carter's sister and his teammate and so I just started getting all these ideas and I don't know I just ran with it I I honestly like I didn't have a plan I'm gonna be honest with you I had zero plan that was one of our questions actually if you kind of knew what couple with the couples were going to be ahead of time or if it has kind of come to you book by book so I guess after book one you were like okay I know who everyone's going to be with yes yeah I think for the most part yeah so Garrett and Jenny, who Garrett is Carter's teammate and Jenny is Carter's little sister. It was near the end of the book that I was like, there's some chemistry here. Like I can, I can put something together here. And then you kind of like build on it a little bit more and sprinkle it in. And I wanted her to be like really confident, like Carter, 
And then I wanted to write somebody opposite for Garrett because you typically see a lot of the, the male characters are, especially in sports romances or, you know, billionaire romances, the men are very cocky and confident and and said Garrett is like a fumbling mess he is so nervous around Jenny so that was really fun to write I just knew that Adam had to have like the sweetest person alive ever in the history of ever um she was not originally meant to be a single mom and then she was always meant to be a vet student which I felt just suited him because, you know, he's got a dog and he's just so empathetic. And so I wanted somebody that was going to be like equally empathetic. And I mean, dog lovers are a good way to do that. But at a certain point, I was like, you know what, if anybody is going to be a step daddy, it's going to be Adam. And it went well with his story as well, because, you know, Adam, um, not to you know spoil anything in case there's anybody out there who might want to read this after they're done but like adam is in the foster care system (laughs) for a little bit and then he's adopted as as a a kid so i really loved like it just felt right to have him in this blended family for his book and like accepting um her son and and whatnot so i really like that and then I added another character in the second book, and that's the story I'm working on right now. And his name is Jackson. And it was literally just I had uh, I, an idea for a story. I wanted it to be within the you know the hockey world, and I was like, well, I want to write this, but I already have books planned for everybody. So I just added him as like a new trade to the team in book two, and made up a, a girl for him. I have kind of like maybe a two part question. Um, Mm -hmm. so you mentioned that like when you started writing, it was for you, you were kind of just like to summarize, making it up as you go along, like figuring Mm -hmm. out what writing a book was like as you went. Now that you have several books under your belt, you are published through multiple means. Um, do you think that a, your voice has changed now that you're no longer just writing for you and B, has your writing process changed at all? Uh, The voice one is, is difficult because I'm going to say no, but I am going to say that it is my biggest challenge because I feel so much pressure to write for other people in different ways too, that I struggle with writing for them and writing for me. So like, you know, first of all, I feel like there is a really big pull right now with, and it may just be romance, but like there's all this trope stuff, you know? And so there's all these tropes and it feels like a lot of people are just trying to like, put all these tropes in their book because it's really hot right now. And if, you know, if you have these tropes listed, then people are going to read your book and it's going to do really well. Or um, like I said briefly, like the language, the dirty talk is gone, just filthy. And I like, I like it. I think there's a time and place where it has to make sense for the characters and whatnot. It sometimes feels like right now what the romance community wants is like filth (laughs) and I mean that in the the politest way like they want dirty romance um right now they want all that dirty talking um they want you know certain um smut scenes and that kind of stuff they they know what they want to see and there's a lot of why choose romances that are like really taking off right now and this is something I've talked about with a few of my other writing friends but it feels like exactly like hockey romance hockey romance is big and now a lot of people are writing hockey romances and it feels like that like this is really really popular right now and so people are writing it and so I feel like I am you know battling with that urge to write what people want to see but then also writing what I want to write because at the end of the day I have to be happy with my book when I put it out there and if I'm not writing what I write, want to write, or if I'm changing it to make somebody else happy, am I going to be happy with it? And I just, I don't know. I think, and I personally think you are never going to fully win if you are writing for somebody else. Because if you're writing to please one crowd, you're, there is always going to be a crowd that doesn't like it. Because people are always going to resonate with certain characters and certain storylines Uh, and whatnot and so that's why I think at the end of the day I have to write for for me but I really struggle with it very often because I I go you know I feel like this is what what people want to see or I you know I'm seeing this like similar theme everywhere right now so I like sometimes will add it into 
my book. And then I go, oh my God, this doesn't suit this character. Like it just does not feel natural. And, but you, it's almost like a popularity contest. Like you feel like you have to do things for these readers and for it to be successful. And so, yeah, I do think that it's a big struggle, but I'm going to say that I, I try my hardest to write for myself because I have to be happy with it at the end of the day. In terms of my writing process, it's definitely changed because I could, I could before just like sit down and pop out all these words and then I'd look up and it'd be like six hours later and I'm going, oh my God, 12,000 words. How the heck did that happen? And they were not 12,000 good words to be clear. They were not good, but (laughs) they were words. You know, I have two kids now. They're 10 months old and two years old. So I am busy. I'm tired. (laughs) So my writing process has changed a lot because it is writing when I can. And I feel like I have to be so much more intentional with my time and with my writing. Whereas before it was, it was really just, you know, whatever came to me. I will say I struggle a lot with that though. I did recently find out earlier this year that I have ADHD, which has been super eye-opening for me about the way I do a lot of things because writing, like working for yourself is really incredibly hard. It's hard to make yourself sit down and do something, especially now with pressure. Like, you know, people want the story, you know, they're waiting for it. You want it to deliver so that you know you can continue to be successful and get new readers and you just you know want people to like you and that puts so much more pressure on you you know like that kind of like inner pressure that you put on yourself and it makes it really hard to do things (laughs) to write but I do you know so before it was literally what's what am I writing next what am I writing in the next chapter and now what I find that I do is I write probably the first 10 to 15 chapters and it is, it's difficult because for me, I don't know the characters yet. I'm just like getting to know them and finding their voice. And then I get to that point and I stop. I know, I always know, you know, these are my conflicts. This is my ending. These are how they're, this is their, you know, meet cute kind of thing. But I filling in the details in between can be some of the hardest stuff. And so I normally get to that point and I try and do a chapter outline for the rest of the story. And then I will go back and I will rewrite the first 10 to 15 chapters. And it's not necessarily like changing major things, although if there are little plot holes, I will adjust them. But it's just because I find I write like a lot of fill it in with a lot of fluff at the beginning because I don't know their voices yet. Um, I don't know what, you know, it looks like inside their brain. And by that point, I do know them, you know, once I get there. So I'm going back and, you know, making their voices, you know, sound more authentic or just kind of fleshing out their characters a little bit more. So my writing process has definitely change now and I I just feel like it's also ever evolving I recently downloaded pacemaker because I'm just trying to force myself to keep writing and keep motivated Um, because I will say that's one of the things about Wattpad is if you are an author on Wattpad and you give your readers an update schedule and you you are sticking to it because you're not wanting to disappoint your readers so I was very consistent with my schedule and writing three chapters a week and without somebody holding me accountable it becomes a lot more difficult so I will say pacemaker has been great I've only been using it for about five days but I am writing every single day because I am trying to hit these word count goals and they have little confetti that shoots off every time you update your progress and like confetti does wonders (laughs) for your procrastinator confetti is very motivating it is yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I imagine like also shifting from almost the like instant gratification of feedback from Wattpad into like now you're kind of just like writing on your own and you have to wait yes. to get that feedback. I imagine that also makes yes. it a little more difficult. It's a hundred percent more difficult. And then even if you have alpha readers reading along the way, like they're typically looking for things. So they're not like just kind of cheering you on the same way. You know what I mean? Like, because people would be like, oh my God, this was an amazing chapter. Or we'll just be like, oh my God, like just 
commenting on everything. So actually I had a chat with my friend this morning and she was like, I'm struggling with writing and all this. And I said, okay, well, why don't we just upload to Google Docs every chapter and comment and read along the way and get that instant gratification because it is, it is really motivating and it is helpful to feel like you have to kind of report to somebody as well. So already she like hopped on my doc before this call, I got a couple notifications and she was like, you yeah, know, like dying laughing at this and that. And I'm like, it makes me feel good. It really does. Cause it like, you want to know that somebody is liking it along the way rather than getting to the end and going, Oh my God, I'm about to put this out. What if everyone hates it? Right. At least along the way you're like, okay, well she really liked this. So I really like that. It's like a positivity writing buddy. Yeah, exactly. I love that. We noticed that you're really active on TikTok too. Can you talk a little bit about what your marketing strategy is there and has it changed since you've moved to traditional publishing at all? I'm going to be honest with you. I have somebody run my TikTok because I am not TikTok savvy. I originally was running my TikTok and it would take me like three hours to make a five second video. I don't follow it. I'm not really on the app. TikTok is to me because it can be amazing and it can be nothing. So it is just so unreliable to me. I think that originally um, when I released Consider Me and Play With Me, TikTok brought me so many sales. Like it really got me out there. I had a few videos do really, really well. And you you can see, that's a nice thing about Amazon, publishing on Amazon is you can like see the immediate benefit so like I'd have a TikTok video do amazing the next day my Kindle Unlimited reads would just skyrocket it is I think in general so important to be on social media and to be present and to be posting all the time it's really overwhelming though to to have to be there especially if you're kind of like an introvert I think TikTok allows you to just kind of post and kind of disappear though which is nice, but somebody makes my videos <laughs> for me. <laughs> she does six videos a week. She does a video every day except for Sunday because I do think it's important to just be visible um, and to have your books constantly being put out there and in people's faces. Yeah, I don't know. I've seen like, I've seen TikTok do amazing things for me. And then I've had like months and months on end where TikTok is just not getting any views. Like, you know, every video is getting like a thousand views or something like that over, you know, a two week period. And it's, it can be really frustrating. So I've learned to just not pay it any mind, but I do think it's important to be on there and to be posting continuously. But Instagram is for me, I think my most important um, place to be personally. No, I think it's good to find like what platform you enjoy being on. And yeah. then, like you, like you said, like delegate if you can. And that way it's less stress and you don't feel like pressured to post on something that you're not even enjoying doing. A hundred percent. I mean, if I, if I like, if, I am out there replying to comments on TikTok. It's me, but I'm just not making those videos. I just, I can't, I don't have, I don't even know like what's, you know, she's amazing. My TikTok girl, her name is Ellie. She, she knows the sounds that are doing well. She knows all the trends. I don't know the trends. By the time I figured out a trend, it's been gone for two months. Like I find a cap cut template sometimes and I'm like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. And you can literally just like import your own words and all I'll uh, make that, but <laughs> I feel so accomplished when I do it. But yeah, I think they're like everybody's got their platform where you know they're they're there and they're visible, and that's what's working for them. I'm not on Twitter. Twitter scares me. I do have a Facebook group, which I love. It's kind of you know a little bit more of a personal space, but Instagram. Yeah, I think Instagram is my kind of my favorite place to be. Again, it can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes. And sometimes you need to step back uh, because it's so hard to keep up sometimes. But people, it's so fun because you post something and I am, I mostly keep my posts funny or I think they're funny. So it's really fun because people love those posts and they love to interact with them. And then you can chat back and forth there. And it's just, it kind of gives me that instant gratification too just by posting there and 
interacting with my fans and seeing them get excited over things. So, And you mentioned that you're working on a couple of things right now. Could you give us a little sneak peek as to what is next from you? Uh, so, so Fall With Me is next, which is the fourth book in the Playing For Keep series. And it is about Jackson. And I... I'm going to be honest, the story's been living in my head for over a year now. One of the reasons I struggled so much to write the last book was because every day I was just like inundated with ideas for Jackson's book and I just wanted to write it. But it's it's funny because you've definitely got the reformed playboy trope in there. And what I really love about my series is that there is no like toxic masculinity. These are all like big, tough guys that they might be arrogant, you know, but they are so loving towards each other. They're not afraid, you know, to like cry and show emotions. They have a lot of um, deep, commu- like meaningful conversations between them. They're really supportive. They're just incredible. Like it's incredible bromance between them. And so here I've got Jackson and he is a big playboy, but he's such a cynic at love. He's just like, I don't need it. Don't want it. What's like, you know, what's it ever been good at kind of thing. And at his core, he is just so desperate, like for like a family, like a friend, friends and a place to like call home because he's been traded from team to team to team. And so he's landed here with these guys and these girls and they are just like one big family, but he kind of feels like they're just being nice to him and he's just going to get traded and they're going to forget about him like every team has done before. And I really am so excited for that because I, I think a lot of the times we see that from the female's perspective, but we don't see that that kind of insecurity about fitting in from a, a man's perspective. So I'm really excited about that. But it also is super heavy on the humor and the antics so lennon the female main character they actually meet while they're both on vacation she's a runaway bride and he is there with another woman whom he can't stand (laughs) and so they get in a fight and she leaves he's next door neighbors with lennon and it's just too many boozy drinks leads to some fun (laughs) and then they think they're never going to see each other and she has shows up after the trip she's taken a job as a team's photographer and social media content person so now he has to see her every day and i don't stop there because i really love making things super angsty and funny so she runs into a little problem with her brand new apartment and winds up being his roommate and they these two just basically live to annoy each other like that is their life goal I will not call it enemies to lovers, but I'm calling it frenemies to lovers because they are, they are kind of friends, but they like just at the same time, hate each other. <laughs> I love a so forced often. proximity. So that sounds great. Forced proximity always hits. I don't know what it is, but it always, always hits. So, and Jackson is also like a little cat dad and he's just like, so ridiculous with the cat antics. Like I have him, um, in play with me just or sorry not play with me unravel me which is the last book that just came out they've got like the guys are all at a family skate with their families and jackson has nobody and he's like well i don't want to be left out brings the cat wears him on his chest and a little cat carrier and he's like he's my family (laughs) and that was when all the comments rolled in and people were like i need jackson's book they could not care less about him when i introduced him in book two because he was very like playboy and I fleshed him out more in book three and now they all want his story. And I just think he's, he's going to be amazing. There's a lot more to him than meets the eye. So I'm having a lot of fun with it so far. It is, I think going to be the funny, one of the funniest stories. I don't know. I hesitate to say funniest because play with me had some very funny scenes. It sounds like so much fun. I love antics mm-hmm. of any kind. So <laughs> and cats and cats. And cat- I also love cats. Oh, yeah. See? I'm a, I've always oh, like done the like writing the dogs in. I have dogs and cats. And I was like, someone's got to be a cat dad here. We have I a lot it. of dog dads, a lot of dog moms. I need a cat dad. And he can't just be like a cat dad. He needs to be an obsessed cat dad. As all cat dads should be, in my yes. professional opinion. Agreed. <laughs> 
And I know we've taken up so much of your time today. So before we let you go, where can our listeners find you online? You mentioned you're very active on Instagram. You're on TikTok. Where, what is your handle on all of the social medias? Uh, on Instagram, I am BeccaMac.author. And oh my God, I'm so unprepared. TikTok, I think I might just be Becca.Mac. <laughs> We'll find you but and we'll it, make sure we have links to everything. Yeah, we'll, we'll link to everything. I'm sure people can find you just by searching Becca Mac too. Yeah, I'm definitely Becca Mac dot author on Instagram though. Okay, Perfect. Great. Well, Becca, thank you so There's much. My dog. Yeah, I was going to say, we mentioned we cats love and them. dogs. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> just summoned them. Yeah. Love and the animal cameos. <laughs> there are currently two cats in the background for our listeners who cannot see. Oh my see. God, there are two. <laughs> I didn't even see them. <laughs> the perfect dogs yeah i love it well thank you care. becca for hanging out and chatting thank with you us so this much. afternoon thank you thank you for having me great <laughs> bye guys thank you for listening to the Kobo writing life podcast if you're interested in picking up becca's books we will include links in our show notes If you're enjoying this podcast, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. And if you're looking for more tips on growing your self-publishing business, you can find us at KoboWritingLife.com. Be sure to follow us on social media. We're at Kobo Writing Life on Facebook and Twitter and at Kobo.Writing.Life on Instagram. This episode was hosted by Rachel Wharton and Laura Granger with production by Terrence Abrahams. Editing is provided by Kelly Robathon. Our theme music is composed by Tearjerker. And a huge thanks to Becca for being our guest today. If you're interested in starting your publishing journey, sign up today at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.